Hey everyone, it's Caro here and welcome back to season two of the Rescued Podcast. I took a little bit of a break over the last few months and I've been working really hard at putting together a really diverse mix of amazing stories loaded with learnings for this season. There's going to be a really solid mix of tales from the three different types of guests that we chat with. Those who found themselves needing to call for help, you know, with that incredible first person story. We're also going to talk to the folk who respond to those types of calls. And then also some experts in different fields like technical or clinical experts or even in policy. When I started this last year, I had no idea what to expect other than I had this really strong belief in not only, you know, the power of storytelling as a way of helping us all learn, but also to honour the teller of those stories for the absolute treasure that they hold. You know, and often they don't realise how special that is until they're given you know, given the platform, given the space to tell that, to share what they've been through. You know, I've been so blown away by the response to that first season. And what it shows is that so many people feel the same way about stories like this. And in some cases have even found themselves in similar situations where they've remembered one of my guests' experiences and have been able to apply those learnings to their own adventures when something hasn't gone quite right. Thank you so much for your support. And to help more people discover these stories, why not click and share on your podcast app, send it to your friends, and it would be great if you can leave a review and a rating as well. You know, these small little acts can really make such a difference. So without further ado, let's kick off episode eight. Rescued is a podcast of conversations with rescuers and those who've been rescued. It's about the lessons we learn about ourselves, the places we go and why, without judgment, to help us have better adventures, manage risk and deal with the unexpected. There is so much more to Mike Atkinson, unknown to some as Outback Mike, than Met the Eye on the first season of SBS Alone Australia in his 64 days, toughing it out in the wilds of Tassie's west coast. I was so drawn in by his sort of endless problem-solving and tinkering to etch out a better existence for himself out there. And I tell you what, that canoe wasn't the first one that he's ever built. So this kind of stuff isn't new to Mike. As you'll learn, he's been doing big expedition-style adventures for decades. In this episode, we're going to get to know a little bit more about what drives this type of life that he leads and what it takes in the form of meticulous planning and testing before committing to something that might cost everything. And not only that, we're going to hear how he made the decision to once push the button. Mike, it's great to have you here on the Rescue Podcast. Thank you so much for coming on board and uh, having a chat with us. I think... You know, if people have seen you in Alone, um, if they've seen that series, they probably may not know a little bit of your background or a lot more of your background. Do you want to just kick off by telling me what kind of a kid were you? I loved the outdoors. I loved camping. I loved going fishing. And I watched the Bush Tucker Man, and that was quite pivotal in wanting to learn about the outdoors and also have that fulfill that survival fantasy of going out on adventures by yourself in a way in kind of extreme ways and, and traveling a love for australia and, and and aboriginal culture as well i also watched top gun so i wanted to be a pilot and that also had a big effect on the things that i did but mostly i wasn't a big group person i just fantasized about being out on adventures really and they just i did my big first big one when i was 17 skin from kosciuszko to canberra and after going through that process i decided that was such a rewarding process that i want to keep doing adventures and Yeah, all those things just kept on running through, flying, military stuff and adventures all throughout my life really until present day. Let's pull apart that word adventure. What does that word mean to you? It's got like three parts of it. One of them is unknown. It's an unknown thing where it's outside your comfort zone effectively and it doesn't necessarily have to be outdoors. 
sometimes you could even think of you know any activity with an unknown outcome like you think baking a cake can be an adventure yeah, exactly you throw the ingredients in you never know what you're going to get at the end yeah so where do you reckon that came from in your childhood you said you you loved that you had the bush tucker man that you used to watch what kind of stuff did you get up to when you were sort of still in school it's hard to know i mean i remember it's from my earliest like memories it's been there i know my grandfather was taking me out hiking a fair bit when i was a kid he was in charge of the himalayan mountaineering institute for a while this is like yonks ago in india and so i did my first like long hike when i was like 11 or something but he he probably had some influence that i don't remember so much because i was too young but mm. my my dad also took me fishing a lot it was up in the mountains and oh, a big factor i reckon is that i lived in Canberra with a view over the Brindabella Mountains. And oh. I was constantly looking out at the horizon and wanting to know what was on the other side. And I just read a book by another guy that must have lived in almost the same street as me that did the Alpine walking track. And he said that affected him as well. And I mentioned that in my book. I honestly think that that is a factor in in wanting to know what's on the other side of the horizon if you just live somewhere where you can always look at it. So would you say you've always had an insatiable curiosity and a wonder. Yeah, yeah, but it's also, yeah, it is. It is a wonder. And in order to feed that wonder, you've got to get to the other side. And then when you get there, there's another horizon and you want to go to the other side. So, I mean, these are obviously kind of traits that are instilled in any kind of, I guess, a human or mammal. You know, there is an exploratory nature that we have. Some people have it more than others. And uh, it's an itch that if you don't scratch it, you're less happy. Well, it's, it's something you mention a few times in your book and your tagline is, you know, life is better with adventure. Yeah, it is. I'm actually wearing a shirt with that written on the back of it. And so, the, well, I first said that was, <laughs> you know, when, whenever you do an interview with any media thing, they always say, why are you doing it? And uh, you can never explain it properly. So I was trying to look for like a, a one sentence answer. So I first used that on like a sunrise interview when I was, doing uh i think that that same expedition actually the dugout canoe expedition and then um i think i ended up saying that again at the end of a loan and that's uh, probably the last thing that i say on on a loan but it's basically true that it, that it is better with adventure and why why is life better with adventure because it it forces you outside your comfort zone it forces you to find out new things in order to be able to complete your adventure whether that be say some factual stuff or stuff on a topographic map or find out from other humans about how they did things. It's constant problem solving. And we evolved in that environment of being having to be able to complete difficult things in difficult situations that were outside our comfort zone. So being at slightly outside of our comfort zone almost is what's needed of us in order to fulfill our ecological niche in the pre-industrial agricultural revolution where most of our evolution happened. So now that so many of us, we live in an urban environment and where that, that sense and that concept of adventure is not a part of our everyday life, what would you say to people who are thinking, maybe listening to you and say, oh, well, maybe he's onto something. Maybe, maybe that's what I need in my life. Maybe I need some of this adventure. I totally agree. And I think adventures that's cl that simulate what we did in our evolution are the most likely to tick the boxes that keep a human happy. Mm. So that's why the kind of survival type adventure or the adventures in the outdoors closely align with what used to keep us happy or at least what we, the niche that we evolved within. Now, there's plenty of other things that for some people might be more effective, like the, the whole like trail running revolution and stuff, like people are going hard and stuff. It's still a, a great adventure. It's not as so closely aligned, but there's plenty of expressions of it. Even, even going to the gym can be a little bit like that. But I just think if you haven't tried that kind of living off the land to some extent outside your comfort zone in the wilderness, you you really won't know what you're missing out on. And it's not necessarily fun when you're there, but when you get back from it and you have time to reflect, you'll be like, man, I'm glad I did that. I'm going to have another bite of that cherry. And it keeps getting bigger. The bigger the bites of the cherry, the more rewarding it is. So before we move on to some of those adventures that you've had, just uh, round us out on your background about that entrance into the military world 
and where where you were with that because I will just you know I'll keep referring to the book a lot through this interview because it was I certainly learned a lot about your background um, by reading Modern Day Castaway and it was I found a lot of it quite surprising in terms of and I guess it shows that stuff that what you don't get you know when when a, a TV program only has a certain number of minutes allocated to you know an episode what you don't learn about the people's background so just fill us in a bit with that. Sure. So c- career wise, I I wanted to be well. I wanted to be the Bush Dark Man, and I wanted to be Tom Cruise. Right. So <laughs> I'm leaving school. Applied for the Air Force, thinking I get in. No worries. Didn't get in. Mm. And then I joined the Air Force in this kind of like army type ground defence role, which was really tough. Which I draw on how difficult that was still today about how horrible that was. I, when I meet hardship, I go, well, it, it didn't suck as bad as that year sucked. Then I applied again, didn't get in. So I went around the world for a year. Pretty pretty extreme traveling, really. I was hitchhiking a lot and going to some pretty pretty gnarly places, extreme low budget, and uh, got back from that. The, the Air Force wasn't taking anybody, so I went to uni to be a geologist because I thought, well, if, I, if I'm not going to end up getting in as a pilot to uh, in the military, I'll just buy my own chopper because my mate was a geologist and doing a lot of helicopter flying, and I thought we could be flying geologists together. And during the second year of uni, applications opened again, but only for the army. And I'd had a couple of experiences like on that Cozzy to Canberra ski trip where these army helicopters flew past in formation. I was like, man, I want to do that too. So <laughs> uh, I thought I will go to the army. Um, that's where Liz Hiddens learned a lot of his Bush Tucker stuff. Yeah. I can tick all those boxes on the way and then I'll transfer to the Air Force, which is eventually what I did. It was just a really hard way of doing it. As an army pilot, I did a lot of a lot of traveling around Northern Australia, Papua New Guinea, some stuff overseas. So I got to see a lot of beautiful landforms. And as someone that likes doing adventures, you're constantly circling your map going, oh, there's a good camping spot, good fishing spot. But also I, I got on as many survival courses as I could. Like I did a combat survival course that any air crew member has to do. But then I managed to go with a totally other squadron called North Force, the North Force Survival Instructor Course. And that's basically, it's predominantly Aboriginal unit. And they the whole point of that course is so you can survive long-term off the land because they patrol in northern Australia for security reasons. Um, so that was a really brilliant course, and I also so I instructed on that course afterwards. And I also did a snow survival instructor course, and I used those skills to ski across Iceland. And I was constantly doing adventures whilst I was a pilot. I just started breaking off and just going out and doing stuff on my weekends, and they grew into bigger and bigger adventures. A lot of them solo. And so, you know, I, they used to have bets on the board about where I would have to pull e when I was on a tinny from Darwin to Derby, stuff like that. But that's where that real, the, the adventures continued and the learning continued and the mistakes continued. And that's, they're some of the kind of self-rescues that I ended up having to do from those fairly tricky situations. And that's, all of those were really embarrassing and hard work at the time, but they are really the, the things that you learn the most from. Well, let's talk about rescue then. I guess there's different types of rescue. There's rescues that people initiate themselves, you know, where someone might push a button or, you know, put their hand up and go, yep, no, nah, I'm out of my depth. I need, need to call in the cavalry. And then there's different kinds of rescues. There's rescues that get forced upon you sometimes by organisations or by um, structures that we work within sometimes that takes away a sense of independence and sense of agency. And I think they can have two very different results on people. So talk talk to me about let's let's talk about that that first one where, you know, it's a self-rescue. Can you take us into a, a moment where you can remember a, a self-rescue that you had to initiate? Sure. And the first one I was actually quite young. I was 16 doing Silver Duke of Ed which is a, a scheme where they get kids in the outdoors to undertake challenges. And I did it with uh, two girls and another guy from school. We did it in the Brinda Bellas. And I just I chose a fairly difficult overland nav through scrub that was fairly manageable. I, th- I think that the distances weren't that great. But one of the people on it had um, diabetes and it, that slowed our rate of movement. And fairly quickly, I thought, well, we're not going to make it all the way to the end. So there's no roads in between. So it's probably smarter that we just go back to the start point. Otherwise, someone will actually have to come looking for us. So we did that. And then we tried to walk around to attract to the end point as well. It didn't work. So we just basically just returned to the start point. And I remember thinking, oh, it's fine. We'll just, um, I'll just hitch out tomorrow and, and get to a phone because this was pre-mobile phone and everything. is early 90s. And I heard a car coming up a day after we were overdue. And I thought, oh, great. 
and it turned out to be a cop car. And I'm like, oh, good, I'll flag him down. And he, the guy sort of jumped out of the car before the car stopped. He's like, oh, are you Michael Atkinson? I'm like, uh, yeah. He's like, oh, I'm so-and-so from Police Rescue. Everyone's looking for you. I'm like, oh, my God. And so they literally were. We had like heaps of vehicles and a big base camp set up at Piccadilly Circus and all that stuff. It was nuts. And the newspaper, the Canberra Times, interviewed us, and we ended up on the front page of the newspaper. And it was just like, yeah, you're kidding. And I re- remember reading the story going, that does not reflect at all what happened. <laughs> you know, we were not in a survival situation, but if you read the story, that's what it sounded like. And so that was a learning point too. It, it, it made me worried about ever getting in the news for being rescued, but I also, it was a good lesson to learn that that newspapers don't tell accurate stories. Yeah, and that would have been back in the days too uh, when Duke of Ed, you had teachers or an adult with you like you do these days. Well, I felt... <sighs> I feel lucky that we didn't get that heavily supervised. There was a teacher that was supposed to come out and check on us, but I knew that he was doing another camp somewhere else in, <laughs> on, the, on the South Coast that weekend. I'm like, I don't think he's going to come and check on us. I, I feel sorry for him because he would have got roasted over the coals when, when we didn't show up. But I, I felt like we were given more responsibility as kids. And I recently helped out on a Duke of Ed camp here from the school that my kids go to. And it was it was too heavily supervised, to be honest, and, and not challenging enough. And that I feel like that's cheating kids a bit, but then- we are so risk averse these days that I kind of, I don't think the school has much choice to, to give kids freedom. So it's it's not their fault. So how old are your kids? You you live, you've got a family. Yeah, 13 and 15. So yeah, we just finished a seven day trek across the snowies, which is pretty hardcore, but they like the outdoors as well. So would you be happy for them if they said, hey dad, we're going to uh, head out to, you know, wherever your local mountains are and going out for a couple of days? Would you? Sure, I'd be encouraging it. So I did my first overnight camp with no parents when I was 13 and I was just lucky that my mum allowed me to do that stuff. Most other mums at that stage wouldn't have allowed me to do that. So I've just been had the freedom to make mistakes and learn things the hard way since I was so small that even by the age of 13, I was pretty responsible because I was given that freedom and that's mm. why so many kids are denied the opportunity of these days. And when you think of that being denied that opportunity and and what sort of brings that kind of thinking about whether it be, you know, past experience or a lot of fear, you know, plays into parental roles. Yeah. What it's actually taking from that experience of that child, like if, if adventure is what, you know, makes life better and how we learn and especially around that problem-solving stuff as well, which, you know, during those, those teenage years is such a great time to be getting a hold of that problem solving. Oh, yeah, for sure. And the responsibility, yeah. Yeah, They're just the, the freedom to make a mistake Yeah, and then have to solve it for yourself, which is basically what happened on that Duke of Edvon when we got we got rescued, we, when we didn't need to be rescued. I, I wouldn't actually change anything the way I do that even now, but um, we, at least we were given the chance to make that mistake, you know. Even Well, we didn't even have to make a mistake. Like, <laughs> it's just funny. It was funny. Yeah, it's a funny experience. So would you look at your exit from a loan as being, you know, similar in that, you know, someone else initiated, you know, pulled the ripcord on you as opposed to being able to pull out when you felt you needed to be? Well, I, I can't talk too much about it, really. I, I did not feel that I needed to be removed. Yeah. I didn't have any symptoms. What That... that modern day castaway expedition my physical degradation was 17 days beyond the point that i was removed on alone when i finished that expedition because i didn't put weight on beforehand so i'm totally familiar with what the symptoms of starvation and degradation feel like that's why i was totally confident in the fact that i'm like i felt it was unnecessary must have been incredibly tough yeah still is yeah yeah Massive thanks for the support from the team at Paddy Pallon, who since 1930 have been leaders in travel and outdoor adventure. In fact, did you know that Paddy himself, a member of the Sydney Bushwalkers Club, was a volunteer in the original search and rescue arm of the Federation of Bushwalking Clubs in New South Wales? Hmm, nice one, Paddy. So let's look then at a rescue that you did initiate. So can you think about a time in your life when you have... And, you know, there's one that you mentioned in the in the book. Yeah. And it's during what that really important kind of planning and preparation stage, which we're going to get to pretty soon. But, yeah, do you want to talk to me about that? Sure. So when I was – so I built the dugout canoe. So I basically, for this expedition, my plan was to place myself in the shoes of a shipwrecked sailor, a genuine one from 1846, mm. and he came ashore from his shipwreck with all his tools and I thought – 
I wonder if he could have made a dugout canoe and sailed it to a rescue haven that Governor Bly had set up in Cape York. I was hoping it would take four months and it ended up taking 14 months because the whole time I was just stressing the whole time, like, man, I, I know what the what the seas are going to be like up there because I've done a lot of stuff in northern waters in small boats and it's scary, um, including two cyclones in small boats. It's um, it's scary. So I was losing all this sleep over, um, you know, I know this isn't going to be able to survive the conditions that I've been in before. I need to keep making it bigger and better and all this kind of stuff. So it ended up taking almost a year longer than I expected and then I was approaching the dry season, which is the safest time to do it, and I was running out of time to test it before I headed up on the expedition. So, you know, there was no great weather window that presented itself. So I took the weather, you know, I knew that um, the conditions were rough, the winds were tending a little bit too far offshore than what I would have liked, and that there was bad weather forecast coming in that night. So not by any stage um, ideal at all, and but... If I, if I waited for another month to get another window, then that would expose me to higher risk when I'm on the expedition because now I'm encroaching on the cyclone season. So I had to take a risk then to reduce the risk later. Mm. So mm. I set off on, the, on this beach in Fingal Bay and there's this old salty guy that's the local kind of marine rider and fishing expert guy and he was down there and he's like, what the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> I ended up interviewing afterwards and he's like, what, who is this lunatic? What's he doing in that boat? It's never going to make it. Anyway, so I set off and... The con- and the conditions changed. There, was, there were several things that went wrong, and that's what happens on adventures. Mm. The wind shifted further offshore. Um, there's a current was out flowing from the port because there'd been some recent flooding. There was a certain twist of the East Coast current due to this headland I was on, and also some equipment broke. The this sail rest at the top snapped and a few things. So basically, I wasn't able to sail into the head, heads of the port. And after this equipment broke and I – Re got the sail up again. I knew that that's it. I'm I'm drifting out to sea. I can probably survive the night, but these nasty winds are coming in. And I'd already been in liaising closely with the marine authorities there because they were quite interested in what I was doing. And I asked them, you know, am I complying with all the rules? And they actually, you know, gave me some extra safety stuff. So we were liaising closely. And I I knew that they would be out and about. It was Saturday afternoon at about two p.m. And I thought. It is more responsible for me to swallow my pride, call them now when they can just literally zip out tow me back through the heads than me to suck it out and stay out here and then be setting off my e at 3 a.m., 30 miles offshore in a 30-knot wind. Yeah. So that's what I did. I ended up just being able to do it on my mobile phone and they came out. But I, because it's such an unusual-looking boat, they, they were like, oh, can we put this on the Facebook page? I'm like, oh. <gasps> I cringe, but I'm like, oh, you just help me out. I'm not going to say no. So they put it on their marine area command facebook page and it went viral and got in the news and the you know the daily mail did a story on it and all this kind of stuff so everyone knew so that kind of i felt that used up my brownie points for a rescue before i'd even headed off on the expedition Mm -hmm. and i and i questioned whether i should even go on it because it you know it's just going to look so bad because everyone's going to go oh he needed another rescue and he didn't even make the, the the test sale so i ended up changing a couple of things there most importantly i took a little backup electric engine just to keep me out of trouble. It only had an hour of battery, so it's not like I could cheat and use the thing the whole way, but it was just to get me out of a tight spot. But um, that was a tricky one, but I, I feel that was the right call to call early when it was minimal impact and also minimal less less safety risk on behalf of those who are going to pick me up yeah. rather than waiting. And, and that's what uh, like a, a life or a career in aviation is all about, that kind of decision-making. And also knowing because I've, I've been the one flying the rescues before, whether it's in a helicopter or an aeroplane militarily. So it's just like, you know, I I know those guys want to be knocking off at 5 p.m. tonight. They don't really care what happens at work during the day. This is going to stuff them around the least. And so that's kind of helpful too. But, yeah, just sometimes sucking it up and making an early call is, is going to be the best outcome. Well, let's let's flip and look at the time when you were you said flying to rescues as a, as a pilot. Um, is there any that stand out that you think we can we can touch on now? I mean, I I was a re- reconnaissance helicopter pilot, so rescue wasn't our primary role. Like I certainly, you know, I've, I've picked up a uh, a girl in a, from a village in Papua New Guinea that had two busted legs, and I was flying an Air Force aeroplane on the search for MH370, that Malaysian plane that crashed out over the Indian mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But pro- I reckon the main bit of advice or experience to pass across would be as a reconnaissance pilot our probably our primary job is to be able to locate people and vehicles for military reasons right and it is um it's incredibly hard to do from a moving aircraft 
And when you're on the ground and you're looking up at the sky, there's nothing in the sky except this one dot that's an aeroplane or a plane and it's really, really noisy. So you think naturally, well, if I can see them, they can see me. But when you're up in the sky and you're looking down at the ground, it's like trying to walk a whole hole of golf and there's one ant hiding in a blade of grass and each blade of grass, you know, in this in this case is a tree. So if you think they've seen you, they probably haven't. Like if, if you see someone, we're going to, in a well, in a chopper, we're going to hover and make hand signals at them. But in a plane, they're going to circle you a lot. And so you really need to put yourself in the pilot's shoes, which is very difficult if you haven't seen a perspective from the air that much. And you just got to make yourself as visible as possible. So like reflection is extreme, is, is the best. Like if you can use a signal mirror or something like that, but that, you know, if it's cloudy or nighttime, that won't work. So that'll be the best shot, but getting somewhere clear, that's why staying next to your vehicle is so important because vehicles are easy to find. And a lot of the the rescue scenarios that I've placed myself in for films, for example, like this one in the Kimberley with these aviators, their plane was found weeks before they were found. If they had stayed with their plane, they would have been okay. But hats off for doing what they were doing. I thought it was pretty epic what they tried to do and escape by themselves. But yeah, put a, you do need to put a lot of effort into in making sure that you're as visible as possible. Like those little space blankets that you can carry, they're like really cheap. They're they're literally a space blanket, but they're shaped like a sleeping bag, and they're they're fluoro orange on one side and. I use carry them all the time. They're massively good for multi-purpose stuff. You can you can use them as a tent. You can get in them, stay out of the rain, use them as a dry bag. But you can also slit them if you need to, and, and make one side fluoro or or silver. And they're really they stand out a lot um, for being rescued. So yeah, it's it's really hard to see a person. So yeah. don't don't rely on that fact that they're just going to be able to see me. Yeah. Put a lot of effort into being visible, and that's what a lot of what combat survival course is about in the military is how to make a signal fire and. And those kinds of things, you make this big triangular fire. And and if you're looking down from a plane and you see this triangular fire, the only people making a fire in a triangle is someone who wants a rescue. Yeah. But these days, really, these days, technology has progressed to the point where you can use your iPhone or you can use um, a satellite tracker like Zolio or something like that. It, just mitigate that risk by taking an electronic tracker, I would recommend. Yeah. So that, that comes into the whole planning and preparation phase. And that was what really stood out when I read your book about the amount of detail that you went into and the amount of time, like you said, you know, your original time scale was pushed way back because of some of the things that you learnt during that problem-solving preparation stage. Can you just talk to us a bit about, you know, planning and preparation and the kind of links that you go to? Because some people, I think, and you might have found this from those articles that came out of the, the Facebook post being shared, you know, people who don't know the full story will make assumptions that, oh, this guy's a cowboy, oh, he's not, you know, really thinking through things. So talk to me about some of that stuff that happens pre an adventure. Sure. And and that is standard and you will always have a lot of people that doesn't matter what your preparation is. And that stops a lot of people from doing adventures and that is a bit of a shame. So mm-hmm. if you're doing an adventure and it all feels wrong, that's a normal feeling. <laughs> but as, as far as the planning and prep goes, particularly for rescue and mitigating safety risk to myself, but also mitigating the amount of resources that would have to get spent looking for me, I did put a lot of effort into that. So primarily it was how am I going to survive? So, I mean, if anyone that's read um, Solo, that uh, Andrew McCauley, who rode across from Tasmania to New Zealand, he ended up passing away and i mentioned him in the book as well his his story and the book that that his wife wrote and the documentary that made about him is is really heart-wrenching but it it does force you to acknowledge what your family will have to go through if if you don't make it back from one of these things but i just thought to myself i must have at all times a life jacket on me that has an a plb in it not an epurb because they're too big a plb is obviously a smaller version of an epurb with slightly less battery life and doesn't float but if it's attached to me i'll be floating so that stayed on me the whole time. Then I also, the other, one of the other safety risks was being eaten by a crocodile. And, you know, it's unusual that if you're getting your leg chopped off by a crocodile that you're going to pull your EPIRB out and send that off. So I knew that I had to have some way, I didn't have to, but it would it would make it a lot easier for me to be found if I wasn't in a, like a state of well-being that I could set my beacon off. But it, particularly it would allow the authorities to f- find where I am if I just carked it instantly for some reason. So by setting off my um, satellite tracker twice a day, once when um, I got to 
um, my place that I was going to anchor for the night or camp, and then another one set off in the morning. That way, they would know that I survived the night. They would all they'd get this breadcrumb trail and know that okay, this is roughly how far he's traveling each day. And I told my mum, who was managing my sort of search and rescue stuff, that um, if if you didn't see one of those for three days, then then to tell the authorities. And I'd already written out all these plans for the authorities with all the stuff that I was carrying and all this kind of stuff, so they could instantly see that know exactly what my experience level is, what my capabilities were. And that kind of stuff. Can I just ask you about that emergency contact? Um, because I was curious that you didn't have uh, your wife Melinda as your contact. You chose for it to be your mum. Talk to me about that decision. We deal with the stress of life-threatening situations in a similar way, but we do it in opposite sense. So I'm I put all my focus in how am I going to stay alive, and I think of every single thing that can go wrong. And then how am I going to mitigate that? She deals with me being away on risky things where she completely focuses on everything else to the point where if she has a bit of free brain space, she's going to go do another task so she can't think about what I'm doing. So if I'm sending her the locations and, hey, look, this, you know, if she's getting the idea that something bad's happening, that's a huge stress on her. And she's managing, you know, family, kids, house, that stuff. Whereas my mum, generally, uh, she, she volunteers all the time and she also understands me very well as as well. So if something's going wrong, she she trusts me. She's not going to panic. And this has happened once before in the Kimberley where my uncle was getting a bit worried about something that happened to me because my satellite messages were coming from the middle of a creek. He thought a crocodile might um, it, it might be transmitting from a crocodile's stomach. My oh. mum was like, no, nah, I don't think that's the case. And in the case, it was actually a dry riverbed and I'd walked out in the middle of the dry riverbed, but he didn't know it was dry. So she's a, she's a steady hand to be giving my details to. So that uh, that just took that responsibility off Melinda. So if basically Melinda knew that no news is good news. If I'm not hearing from my mum, Rosalie, then everything's going well. What I'm seeing and hearing from you now is stuff that surprised me reading because I think there's this sense that I guess it's harking back to that Top Gun thing, you know, the, you, you think it's, it's this male adventure and indestructible and this sense of going out. But you touched on a few times about the emotion of adventure. And how yeah. emotion quite often welled up. And so what's interesting about that is that it's only in relation to my family and how worried they are about me. Mm. So like even then where I'm getting emotional, it's because I'm thinking in my mind how happens <laughs> again. It's only when I think about people worrying about me. Mm. So whereas for actual risk for myself, getting emotional is completely irrelevant. And it's a lack of focus. It, so there's no point to it. So like I have never, like I mean, I would never cry over risk in a risky situation. It's just, it's just not even. It's, if that's entering your mind, then you're not, you're not focusing well. And, and there's techniques that I that I've learned and and uh, I teach to other people about how not to focus on that kind of thing. So yeah, it's quite, um, yeah, emotion for me is reserved for the impact I'm having on other people. If if I something happens to me and so the reason that got emotional is because i was also comparing the survival situation that i was in to what this shipwreck survival was in which was forcing me to liaise a lot with aboriginal communities and they were telling me about the massacres and all the stuff that happened to their communities so i was linking the you know imagine if i was an aboriginal person and you know it was my loved ones that were getting massacred like how would i feel so that that really linked very strongly and so i, I would get really emotional chatting to elders and stuff um because <laughs> it really hits home when when your loved ones aren't, aren't coming home, and I felt like I was possibly about to put someone else through that. In the very start of the book, you talk about from having discussions and asking for permission and seeking those relationships with the elders that of the places you were travelling through. You talk about not sharing location details and the and the actual specifics of sites. Yep. Can you explain to us a bit about the thinking behind that? Because I know that these days. Social media is it's a challenge in terms of protecting place. Yeah, and it make it makes sense if I mean if you've got a secret fishing spot and you tell people where it is, no it's no longer a secret fishing spot and there's no fish to catch there anymore. And that's the same in many adventure situations, which is why I, I try where possible, particularly in remote areas, not to not to name places, particularly on things like Instagram. Like even I was in a hut there um, in the high country a couple of weeks ago and on Instagram I didn't I, I put a comment in there that would just allow people to know that I didn't really want a guessing game to start about which hut it was, but they can go to my YouTube video and figure it out, you know, because you, you can see that. But but Instagram's one in particular, but in general, 
like a beautiful remote unknown sites, once they're uploaded to something like Google Maps, particularly with a photo that makes it look beautiful, then it in 10 years' time, it'll probably have a, a four-wheel drive track to it, you know. If it's a sacred site for Aboriginal people, that's the last thing that they want. So I've been specifically told by elders, do not ever put coordinates to the, the places you've been on anything electronic. And so when I was um, looking at the Cape York, I was myself trolling through Google Maps and I came up with these, this really awesome place, which I don't want to talk too much about because I don't want to send people on, on the trail, but it was really beautiful. And I thought, I'm going to go there and I figured out how I was going to get there. And I asked the traditional owners, you know, can I, you know, I've got permission to be in their country. And I said, oh, by the way, can I go to this place? And they're like, no, 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 no. People have started going there. And so they really don't want that at all. So, yeah, that is is important. And it's nice to know as humans that there is places that are beautiful and that I don't know the location. So don't give away the really beautiful remote places. And there's something about holding the sense of wonder about that in that actually not having the answers to everything. We can, you know, when we're planning and preparing for an adventure, we can like, like you said, you you think through every single possible thing that could go wrong and then you look at how to mitigate those and you, you plan to this nth degree and, and it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I've got all these knowns. But to always hold true that there's always going to be something we don't know yeah, actually I think it's a great way of keeping ourselves humble and, and keeping us in that that sense of wonder. I agree. Yes, yeah, so you're right. It's not just for the benefit of the remote place. It's for the benefit of us humans to know that those places exist. In, a, in some ways, that's sort of one of those risks. If you think of, well, what are all the possible things that could go wrong? Well, not only to myself, you know, my family and how I can, you know, the things physically that could go wrong, but I guess environmentally and socially, there's mm. other things that we could consider I agree. I feel um, that if it's done right and people just know that that general corner of Australia has beautiful stuff in it, but I don't know exactly where it is, that means when a mining company wants to go and put a pipeline right through the middle of it, they'll be like, oh, no, I I saw something once and that was in that area and that's not a good idea. Like the Kimberley, for example, uh, Tiwi Islands, like there's, there's lots of beautiful places where I think the right amount of exposure provided it's not um, specific to the actual location, I think, is has more benefit than risk, like than than detriment. Well, tell me about risk assessments then, because you know, you know, if I was just thinking, oh, you know, this weekend I want to head out and have a bit of an adventure, you know, I'm inspired by by listening to all this. It's not just as easy as like stepping out your front door and you know heading to the bush somewhere. What what do you do when you're trying to think through a risk assessment? And to those of us who might not know what that is, what does that look like? For me, I mean, I don't follow a set thing. A, a great deal of risk assessment is how experienced you are. So there's there's two types of risk. There's perceived risk and actual risk. So if you don't understand something, your perceived level of risk might be very different to what the risk is. Sometimes you'll think it's way riskier than it is, and other times you'll think it's no risk at all and it's really, really dangerous. So that's... The, the more experienced you are, the more accurate your risk assessment is, which is why I was up all night for, for almost a year stressing about the, the waves I was going to encounter. If I didn't know that those waves could pop up like that and I hadn't been in a cyclone in a four-metre tinny, I would have had a false sense of security that the risk wasn't as high as it was. And my accurate assessment of the risk was really stressful, you know, um, but it was extremely accurate. So, so when you don't understand the risk, you need to be more conservative, of course. So if you haven't done lots of stuff, then – Pick a smaller goal. I, I really think if you just take a communication device that's going to work outside of mobile coverage, that's probably the, the best risk assessment you can do because you can always just message somebody. Now, there's a time and a place for not having that, but I, what I particularly like about the satellite trackers is you don't talk to anybody. So you, that not only relieves the pressure of having to talk to someone, but it stops you breaking out of that mental space as well. So it's it's okay just to press a tick button and everyone knows where you are. And if you need to, hey, I've twisted my ankle and I've lost my diabetes medication. Help, you know. Like so I think that's a really important mitigator. Obviously things like knowing how to deal with a snake bite and, and a few basic first aid stuff's important as well. But these days it mitigation is a lot easier. It, even for solo adventuring and I I kind of encourage solo adventuring provided it's you acknowledge the risk that you're taking and you take some tracker thing that means you can call for help if you need it. So making decisions like that to take a to take a tracker, like you say, like a Zolio or something like that, and that that process of decision making can seem a lot more straightforward when you're in that planning phase, in that preparation phase. What about having to make decisions in stressful times or in crisis moments? 
And is there anything in particular, a, a story or a situation you can think of? Um, there's several aspects to that. So there can be many reasons why it's more difficult to make a decision in stressful situations. For example, like driving license, getting a driver's license. I was, you know, 17 and I was I was really concerned the whole time about, oh, did I go over the speed limit back there? And, you know, if so, you know, am I going to pass my test? And what I should have been thinking about that time is, you know, am I blinking the turn right here? So my focus was not in the present. It was somewhere else. Flying is extremely high pressure. I I did you know reasonably well through all my army helicopter stuff, but when I when I transferred to the air force and I was flying jets, it was it's really top of the line stuff, and I and I wasn't performing as well as I should have, and I started failing some rides, and I looked at how I was focusing, and I realised that I was focusing incorrectly, and I actually went to I was at a, an instructor development seminar, and it was they had a speaker from a sports psychologist from the states, and he was talking about how sports people do it, like Tiger Woods for example. And he's at you know 18th hole and there's all these people crowding around. He could be thinking in his mind, well, if I slice this ball, I'm going to hit that old lady in the head. The wind's really strong. I might, you know, how am I going to do this? And if I lose this shot, I'm going to lose my number one ranking. That's normal human behavior to think like that. But if you come up with three statements about yourself, which you know to be true, that can get your mind back into focus, such as I'm Tiger Woods. I've practiced more than any of the other guys on this golf course, so I don't care that it's it's the 18th hole and all this wrestling on it. I'm going to nail it. You know, I don't care that it's crosswind because I practice my crosswind game better than anyone else. And yes, I, you know, it, am I going to slice it, hit that old lady in the head? No, this is my chance to show these people how good I am. So that once you have that positive mindset, it it flicks you into just focusing on what matters. Is my stance correct? What's the range of the hole? Am I, have I got the right club? So I think. Whether you're an ambo and you're peeking out because you're, you're new to the game and you're worried about how you're going to perform when you get to a, a nasty accident, or whether you're a mountain guide that doesn't have much experience with a cliff rescue and you're worried how you're going to do it, that that mindset, that technique is quite a useful one. If you don't have that technique and no one teaches it to you and you don't really practice it, then experience obviously helps. And so for me, like because I've been gaining the experience since I was a little kid, it's hard to understand why you would ever flap in a situation in an outdoor situation but but in because the aviation thing was so different i was kind of flapping a little bit but i was able to get around that through using these psychological techniques do you have a personal story about an incident or rescue during an outdoor trip when something didn't quite go to plan maybe you got lost injured let down by some gear preparation or something else look honestly it can happen to any of us at any time regardless of how experienced we are. And it's by sharing these stories and tales that we can all learn and help to avoid them in the future. So if that's you, I'd love to hear from you. So please drop me an email to rescued at lotsoffreshair.com. That's rescued with a D. What about fear and how fear can affect you in the middle of a crisis or in in an adventure? Yeah, it certainly can. And that's where that pre-analysis of what the risks are going to be and the setting up of a set bunch of procedures that you're going to follow when that situation happens allows you to focus completely on it. You know, So, for example, when I was doing my Kimberley expedition that I made that feature film about, I would, I would think, right, okay, I'm sailing along in my catamaran that I made out of seaplane floats and um, something snaps and I'm floating towards the shore. What am I going to do? And I'll run through in my head, okay, first thing, because I've been through this situation before and I ended up, um, this is in a, in a cyclone, by the way, I ended up getting smashed up on the rocks and having to self-rescue, right? Um, and then I, I thought about that thing many times. What, oh, I should have chucked the anchor out. Why didn't I not chuck the anchor out? So I basically, this one, I knew what to do. I'm going to chuck the anchor out first and that'll prevent me from getting on the rocks, which will give me enough time to do this and then that. And then so I'd have all of these procedures in what I would do set out, set out in a logical order that you can constantly improve the more experience to get. And now as a filmmaker, I realized I'd go through that situation. I'd go, you know what? At no stage did I turn the camera on. So I would go back, rehearse it in my head, turn the camera on, then throw the anchor out, you know, the placement of my cameras. So that's that's the way to deal with high pressure, high performance situation is to have have thought about what could happen, have a set plan that you that you know so well that you automatically start executing. And that's that's what being a pilot's all about. I was going to say, you, you know, we see images of pilots in cockpits all the time with their checklists, endless checklists, and there's a checklist for any scenario that is likely or unlikely even to emerge, but you've got a you've got a way of dealing with it. Exactly, and 
as a pilot, there's two types of checklists. There's boldface checklist and there's non-boldface. Boldface is the stuff in boldface writing that you have to know for memory. As a military pilot, you have to know like just reams of information, kind of boldface. And you, when when you teach someone or when you learn this stuff, you have to not only say the word like boost pump off. You have to move your hand and physically move the pump. So if I'm assessing a guy as a flying instructor, has he learned his checks well enough? You know, like for example, my helicopter the throttle boost pump fuel valve battery frictions off. Like when you when your mouth stops talking, your hands already know where to go. That's another thing in a in a in a, in a survival situation in an aeroplane. You need to have practiced all your procedures to the point where. You don't. You, you hands just go where they where they go. The same way that you know you drive a car and you automatically blink and you look over your shoulder and you know where to go. Every, but that's automatic, but it's practiced, and, and you can kind of drive to work on autopilot because and, and you get to work and you're like, man, did I even drive here? But because your body's really good at multitasking, if it, if if it knows the tasks really well. So you, with with boldface and with emergency prep, like if you're an ambo and you're at top of your game, you, you, you just know exactly what to do when. But it's guided by a very thorough checklist, which is reviewed. And when something's missing, it's placed in there and memorized to the point where that new step is in the process. So that's that's how to optimize performance in a high pressure situation. So even just thinking of you know the more day to day adventures that some of our listeners that we we get up to, you know, going for a hike, whether it be like a single day hike or a multi day, like you've just come back from the snowies. Like let's say you're in a situation where you know you're camping up on the main range, the winds of you know not what was planned. You've got gusts up to 80 k's an hour the tent was four season but it's kind of you know for some reason the poles snapped <laughs> or something like yeah yeah been there a few times <laughs> <laughs> I say, it sounds sort of familiar doesn't it um let's say poles have snapped for whatever reason yeah. um you know equipment failure having already thought through that that could be something that could happen could be a great way to help you have a much better outcome absolutely and then when you've prepped to that point, you're no longer flapping because you've you've already decided. Like when you wake up that morning and you saw that the, the fog was down here, you're like, you know what? Just double check that I've got my bivy bag on the outside. You know what I mean? Like, So the more experienced you become, you know, the, the, the earlier on you've planned for that eventuality. But when you're, in, when you're a newbie, like the first time I skied from Cozy to Canberra, it was um, – <laughs> It was oh, t- 92, and we had just out of fluke. We had the coldest night in Australian history. Um, the night before, it was minus 23. I think the night we were out, I think it was about minus 17, and we were in like sleeping bags that weren't. My mate was in a sleeping bag that wasn't even rated below zero. So you, you just end up dealing with those things. Whereas now, I'd be like, well, I've had that experience, so you, you just you plan differently. So that's the thing about adventure. It doesn't matter how experienced you are, curveballs are still going to come. I- I've rarely found myself in a flap though for a long time but we all know people who flap and i love that you use the word flap because you know there's people who get a bit flappy it's like yeah. a crisis goes on and it's just like uh, uh like yeah, you know yeah. say something you're in a party and someone you know slips and falls breaks something yeah and knowing what you'll do and practicing it in your head having those kind of checklists even if they're i mean just only mental checklists going through things can just completely change an outcome for someone and I also think, particularly in the first aid sense there, that like many people, if I see a really bad injury, particularly if it's on myself, I feel a little bit faint. And I know that I feel a bit faint if I get a nasty gash in myself. So I try to expose myself to as much blood and guts and gore as I can to help normalize that. So like when I get a needle at the doctor or an IV, I watch them do it, even though I don't particularly want to. And so I've given myself, because I was a combat medic in the army um, as well, because our chopper squadron didn't have a search and rescue facility up in Darwin, so they trained us to be combat medics. And so I've given myself IVs and it's really uncomfortable putting a large needle into your foot. Actually, I learned to do it in my foot because then you got both hands free. Yeah. And I started out trying to do it into my arm. So I think there's a responsibility to do that. So you might be driving along with your family one day and there's a horrible accident and it might be one of your loved ones that's got a horrendous injury that if you just can't deal with it, that's kind of, I, I kind of think you need to be, for your whole life, be, be exposing yourself to as much injury and ability to perform in a in a horrible first aid situation so you can perform when the time is needed. What about another point of planning, which I don't know if too many people think about is, you know, we, we plan because we have this curiosity, we have this question we want to answer or this what's on the other side or, you know, what about that end goal? And I think, you know, in mountaineering we think of it as summit fever and what if you can or can't reach a place that you're going and at what point do you make those critical decisions to change your end goal? Yeah, and that's just a comes down to a, a risk management plan. And, and one thing that is normally overlooked with risk management plan is you've got to 
weigh up the upside, yeah. you know, and, and not just the downside. And, and if this is something really important to your life and this is a one-off opportunity, you know what? It's okay to take a bigger risk, you know? Like if you got a – people look at guys, 18-year-old guys doing motocross and they're doing triple backflips on a, on a motorbike. For them, that's their entire career and their sense of self-worth. It's worth them trying a quadruple backflip. For me, it's not because it's not my sense of self-worth. It's not how I make my income. So, yeah, you do have to be prepared to say no and not achieve your goal if the risk is too high. Yeah, And that's why you need to be practicing risk decisions since you're a little kid, you know? Mm. If you just start when you're 18 and you get booted out the door, that's when you make the really bad decisions. What's the solution? How do we get – how do we How do we bring this back into our culture? I, I just think – Allow kids to be exposed to risk from toddlers. You know, allow them, allow them to fall off the playground and smack into their face, and and then they'll realise don't not to do that. Or you know, like just give them that chance to find their boundaries the hard way, not not be told what they are. Absolutely. You talk of your love for solo adventures. Something that comes up a lot of the time is people thinking about loneliness. Can you talk to me about that sense of uh, to use the. The name of the program, Alone. So, aloneness yep. versus yep. loneliness. Well, when I go out on my adventures like Alone or even the you know the Great Barrier Reef Trip or any, any of them, I'm not phased at all by being alone. And I think that's just because I've been exposed to it. The first time I ever did my first solo thing by myself, I was actually 18. I was traveling or 19, traveling the world after not getting into to being a pilot. And I was in Italy and, uh, you know, I was – living like real povo and I just thought, okay, I, I don't I want to sleep in this train station. It looks pretty dodgy. I'm just going to climb up that mountain. And the whole night I was like, oh, man, is there lions and tigers in Italy? I've got no idea. So I was peaking the whole night and it was really uncomfortable and stuff. And then I just sort of had to repeat that to the point. So that was way outside my comfort zone and now it's just totally in my comfort zone because I've just been exposed to it. And most of that is just because I never had a friend around at the time that was in that position with with the equipment available and the time off work and all that kind of stuff. So it, it normalizes over time. So that's probably I think the reason that I, I, I find it completely normal. And and other people that do it a lot get to that state as well. What about fatigue? You know, thinking of those multi day adventures, the really long, long ones. So you've mentioned a few, you've mentioned the Kimberley. Yeah. You've mentioned the East Coast in the dugout. Yeah. Um, what are some of your other big multi-day? Uh, I've skied solo across Iceland and across the desert. Well, sort of half across. I had to cross it back again in the, in the Saudi Arabia with camels that I owned. And yeah, there's there's lots of long solo ones. But the most difficult to answer your question about fatigue, by far the most difficult was the barrier reef one because I'm starving at the same time and there's yeah. huge energy expenditure all the time. So yeah, you feel really really tired and it sucks and you have to film on top of that. And so you basically, you just have to divorce the side of your brain that gives in to discomfort and just go, not listening, get up and, and go. That, it became harder on that, bar- on that barrier reef one because it was to the point where if I, if I ignore that too much, I'm not going to make it because I was, you know, I was stuck on an island for 10 days with no water and I was, you know, like that, that was becoming a, more of a hard decision because it was going on for so long. How does fatigue affect your decision making at that point, or were you switching back into that that psychological? Okay, I've got. I, this is something I've planned for. I've planned for fatigue. I know I need to just bring out a checklist and kick my own ass and get out of bed. Yeah, I didn't need a checklist for that. It was just I, I just didn't have a choice. Like I, I guess exposure to hardship and being able to compare it to other hardships it just makes it easier to be able to deal with the next one. So mm. that's why having a big stock up of hardship is is a good thing behind you. So I keep drawing back to that horrible year in the in the Air Force when I was eighteen. And so, particularly if you if you live a comfy life and you you never experience hardship, sometimes the worst thing that's ever happened to you is you know maybe someone's mean to you. Like whereas if if <laughs> so yeah, like your, your benchmark or your your low tide mark is um, is in, it's important to have a couple of low tide marks in your mark in your life because it makes you happy because you have got something to compare how bad life can suck. Mm. And and that's the whole aim of life these days is to have it so comfortable that you never experience anything detrimental, which actually doesn't have the effect of making you happier. It just means that everything's almost the worst thing that's ever happened to you your whole time, you know. So adventure sort of forces you to end up in a situation that really sucks, but you would never volunteer to be in that situation. But seeing as you don't have a choice, you just suck it up and then all of a sudden you're happier for it. And like, it's like doing that trip with my kids just recently. It sucked a lot of the time. They didn't enjoy it, but they're happy that they did it now that they finished it. I'm looking forward to going and watching that YouTube video, by the way. So would you say there's there's a certain comfort that you get from discomfort? Not not at the time, 
but but it does scratch an itch later that that makes you happy. At the time, it just sucks. Yeah, but but you can choose to dwell on that or not. You know, you, you can you can choose to focus on something else that that's that's positive. You know, like so in Tasmania, it was freezing cold, pretty hungry. So I would just think if I most of the time I was concentrating on the task that I was doing to catch fish and you know trap patty melons and stuff. But if I did have free time because it was raining and it was dark and I'd already done all my tasks for the day. Then you know I'd think about okay what am I going to do at home with the kids and you know how am I going to fix the pergola so I'm I'm, I'm always got tasks in my mind about um, so I'm not just sitting there stewing on oh this really sucks and why am I doing this like you, you can waste a lot of focus wondering about why you're doing something that isn't productive and I, I just try to avoid those thoughts. You're giving yourself tasks even if they're mental tasks. You're stepping through things. Yeah, not necessarily for the sake of it because I needed to go through those tasks because I do need to paint the pergola. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, so picking useful things. Like if, you, if you're doing it just for the sake of switching focus, it's not as good as if you really need to think about something. So that's why, that's why being busy is good. It's healthy. How do you now plan for future adventures given the experiences that you've had in your past adventures? Uh, I mean, I just go around it exactly the same way, really. I don't really want to be exposed to that such crazy risk on an ocean for so long again, but I'll probably end up doing it. <laughs> but but uh, it hasn't really changed that much, actually. I'm just excited about being that I'm getting better at being able to capture it and tell the story on, on film. That's, that's another side of it that adds another layer. But it, I don't think I'll change anything about how I approach things. Do you feel that you made mistakes in the Great Barrier Reef journey that it, were, you learned from went, well, I'm certainly not going to do that again? No, not really. Of course, you know, I'd be more experienced at it next time, but nothing really springs to mind. And particularly if you make a decision and you can remember the reasons why you made it, I'm never hard on myself afterwards about it, you know. Uh, if it's a really important decision, I'll, I'll write a list of pros and cons and things. But I was really happy with how I went about it. So what yeah. is the future then? What what are, what are some things coming up for you? What's in the pipeline? Well, I need to just get the film out, but I've been doing these other adventures overseas and stuff that have come up off, and that takes a long time to edit them. I'm looking at trying to outsource the editing at the moment. And then I want to do YouTube shorter adventures, and that just gives me the freedom to do something, hopefully send it off to an editor and then go to the next one and just have more freedom to to pivot and go in a totally new direction if, if an opportunity comes up rather than putting all my eggs in one basket for like a three-year adventure. And so is that... The Mike Atkinson that we see these days is Mike Atkinson, the filmmaker, and adventure, or is it Mike Atkinson, the f- adventure filmmaker? Yeah, no, it's adventures first. Uh, I, I only want to do stuff that's worth doing for the sake of doing. Yeah, but they, I guess they're quite interwoven now. Uh, what I found interesting is that your adventures seem to have a, there's an origin story to them. There's a there's um, like for instance the story of the shipwreck for the feature films. Yeah, and there's a lot of develop story development and research that goes into that. It takes a long time to come up with that idea. Really, like it starts as a very general one and gets more specific. I had to go to Queensland to find out where where they used to try and get to. I knew it was somewhere on Cape York. So yeah, that, t- that takes a lot of development. So you're not going to put that much effort into each YouTube thing, but I can certainly just look at other rescue you know, people who've been in situations and follow that theme for a bit. Yeah, that that does certainly slow a project down, having to do that amount of research. For sure. So finally, where can people uh, learn more about what it is that you're up to? My website is Outback Mike and so is my Instagram. I think it's Outback underscore Mike. But if you just go to my website, Outback Mike, you'll see everything. I'm doing a podcast too where I interview other adventurers for my own sake as much as anybody else's. Um, there's, yeah, there's lots of different ways, but my YouTube channel is Outback Mike as well, so that's the best place to find me. Is that .com.au or just outbackmike.com? Uh, .com. Great, Mike. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you for sharing your stories. And, yeah, can't wait to go and see that um, Snowy Mountains trip and also can't wait for that film to come out. Thanks a lot for having me. Well, I feel like that chat was a journey in itself and one that added so many facets to what I knew about Mike Atkinson than what we saw on Alone. Father, husband, son, author, Duke of Ed volunteer, filmmaker, pilot, combat medic, and of course, adventurer and meticulous planner. If you're thinking you'd like to work on your planning or preparation for adventures, why not join me in Lutrawitta, Tasmania from the 24th to the 27th of April this year, 2024, when I'm going to be bringing my Introduction to Navigation course to the beautiful heritage village of Corinna, deep into Kaina, the Tarkine, on Tassie's wild west coast. 
Over four days, you'll learn the essentials for on and off track navigation, build your confidence in finding your way in the bush and for making wise decisions in the outdoors. Spaces are limited to just 10 people, so check out all the details on my website, lotsoffreshair.com. That's Lotsa with an A. I'd love to see you there. The Rescued Podcast is produced on the unceded lands of the Gundungurra and Darug people of the Blue Mountains of New South Wales. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and acknowledge their enduring connection to and care for country. Special thanks to our sponsors, Paddy Pallon. This has been a Lots of Fresh Air production.